Good morning, Mr. Ismail Asizi. Welcome to the Chronicle. Thank you, and good morning, and welcome to my house. Thank you. Um, you are known to be, you know, a political science lecturer, obviously, but little was known about you in terms of, you know, having political ambition. How long have you been harboring this? Well, that's a very difficult question. Uh, thank you very much. Like I said, uh, thank you, Keba, for coming here to interview me, and I thank the Chronicle. How long have I been harboring this ambition? Um, well, it's the ambition has been there to be part of that generation to transform the Gambia. That has been a lifelong ambition. Um, so, not necessarily as a president or as vice president or minister, but part of being being part of the generation, that group okay. of people. So that ambition has been there since childhood. When I look around me and I see poverty, I see the kind of education we, had, we were forced to go through. I see that I was forced to drop out of school at primary six <clears throat> because I didn't have the support to go to high school. And I had to go to Freetown to pursue my secondary school education. I see that after schooling, I couldn't find a job as a young man. I was forced to migrate to Europe to go and hustle. I think it was galvanized when I arrived in Europe. And I saw how that society was and how they build their country. At, in every aspect, at every level, from healthcare to education to infrastructure to even welfare, even welfare of animals. Okay. And that gave me the, the zeal, the determination that, look, I have to, at some point, be part of that generation that's going to transform my country. So that, that ambition has always been there. All right, but then before you get to that, um, and to, to actualize that ambition, you actually went to university and then impact your knowledge on young people. Of course. Who actually, actually what decision makers. Yes. Um, last year, or to 2018, we've had President Barrow attacking you that, you know, where were you? Where were you, Dr. Sisi? That was very famous. Um, but, but, you know, I asked you about when, how long have you been harboring this political interest? Was President Barrow right at that moment? I don't think he was right. And I think he got a fitting response from those who knew where I was at the time. But, but he knew that you were an opponent. At the time. Not an opponent. I was not in the opposition. Well, I, you was were not a, I was not a politician. But you had an ambition. He must have known that you have, you've had an ambition at the time. I have an ambition, yes, of course, to, to change. My, my obsession is to see this country change, no matter how that happened. So, obviously, he was president at the time. The a coalition, he was part of a coalition at that time. They sold us an agenda. The agenda was attractive. We all bought into the agenda that now it's time for us to put the country on a path of development. The driving force of that was supposed to be the reforms that were supposed to take place. The change in the way we govern this country. When we saw that didn't happen, and we saw how the whole enterprise was aborted, and we saw how there was a shift from the reforms to focusing the agenda on entrenching the political ambitions of one man, we started speaking out. Now, if that is seen or if that is interpreted as political ambition, well, that's, uh, it's open to, uh, but at that time, I was, when we were speaking at that time, it wasn't because we had political ambitions. If we had political ambitions, there are many different routes. We could easily have just ignored what was happening or just praising the president at that time and he'll make us a minister or he'll bring us closer to him. From within now, you pursue your political ambition. It's more difficult to pursue your political ambition from outside the levels of power than from within. There are those who are work, working with him. Now, you think they believe in his agenda? No, they don't. Because they have a political ambition. And they think the easiest way is to pursue it from within the level corridors of power. Then you get access to resources. You get access to the networks you need. Pursuing it from outside is much more difficult, especially in the Gambian context. Because once you're opposition, people say, a People don't even want to have anything to do with you. People don't even want to fund your party activities because they might be seen as a sympathizer to your party and, you know, it's, it's a small country. So why should I take a difficult route if I had political ambitions as a young man who could easily start from being a minister in Barrow's government and find, find my way up? Because I, for me, politics is about principle. It's about a vision. And if I don't align with a principle and a vision, I wouldn't necessarily join. I'd rather go on my own. What are, the, what are the things you can pinpoint to say that, you know, this is what I am dissatisfied with Boros government? You know, to be specific, you know, accountability and transparency. What is your view I mean, on this? It's, 
it's very simple three things see baro was elected to do a job not even baro the coalition was elected to do a job in 2016 everybody left where they were people left their political parties people left their job people left the fact that they were working within civil society even journalists became politically engaged because the coalition sold us an agenda that we thought was attractive that we thought was the right agenda to move us away from dictatorship on a runway where we launch our, our democratic democratic aspirations so we thought that when the coalition came to government they would pursue that agenda if you look at the coalition agenda, I can't remember the specific section, it says that, look, we'll put up a group of jurists okay. and they look at all the bad laws and within three months we'll repeal the Public Order Act. The coalition started using the Public Order Act against citizens. The first thing they took to parliament was to change the of the vice presidency to suit themselves. So we saw how there was a mass betrayal of the Gambian people by the coalition. They thought they were going to fight corruption, they told us. Instead, now, corruption is more rampant than under dictatorship. So three things only just to answer your question. They fail to pursue the reforms. Even the, I think, look, look at the constitution, Keba. The whole idea was, the whole campaign was, Jamais' constitution was bad. It was changed 52 times. When we come, we are going to have a brand new constitution. What, what happened? What, what is your take on the no, constitution? I'll come, I'll come to that. Yeah. But, even, even the basic reforms, the, the, the linchpin of the whole reform process, the new constitution, was even aborted because of political, some particular individual's political interests. So no reforms, no will to fight corruption. The, most, the sad part of it is that there is no vision. We thought that the new government was supposed to give us at least an idea as to where we should be head to. A vision. How do you solve today's complex problems? They could argue that they have NDP and then... Anybody who read NDP will know that it's not a right document to solve our basic problems. It's copied and pasted from the page and from, the, or from other previous documents that have, that have failed. Vision 2020. Gambia needs a new master plan to not only solve today's complex problems, but anticipate future problems and find solutions for them now. That is what is needed. What will be our problems in 20 years' time? That's what governments do. You use data to, understand, to see into the future that in 25 years' time, okay. because of this demographic dynamics, because of the way our environment is going, because of statistics in trends in education, trends in healthcare, this is what the outlook will look, this is how our demographic economic outlook will look like in 2015. So, because of the demographic outlooks, what are the likely problems to emerge from these outlooks? Then you get those problems and start finding solutions for them. I've always argued, my only problem with this government is three things. They are lack, they are the lack of the political will to fight corruption in this country. Okay. Two, the failure to pursue the reforms that they promised us. And three, the lack of a vision to tell us where this country will go. But I don't fault them for the problems we are facing today. I don't fault them. Who do you fault? The previous, gener the previous leaders. Because the problems today are, did not start happening today. There was a failure in planning 25 years ago. By the government in 1990 to sit and say, in 2020, this is how the demographics will look like. Gambia will have 2.3 million people. Out of these 2.3 million people, 65% will be young people. What will they need? Jobs. You start planning and preparing for those jobs at that time. These problems are structural, perennial. Electricity, water, the poor education sector. These don't happen overnight. They accumulate over time. But the idea was that anybody who was supposed to replace Jame was to do things differently, diametrically different from Jame. But this government is doing exactly the same thing. The way they politic, the way they do politics, the way they govern, and everything. I haven't seen any difference. So now that Citizens Alliance has, has come to, into being, what do we offer, what do you offer differently as a party? What we offer differently to is the at, people? at two levels. The way we run our political party, the way we engage the Gambian citizenry, 
and the kind of vision we want to put in place to move this country and transform it so it looks like a 21st century country. We want to have an agenda for this country, not only in focusing on today's problems, but also finding solutions for future problems to ensure that the welfare of future generations is ensured. That is an important point. How do you go about that? Like I told you just now, you understand the trends. You look at the demographic dynamics. You look at our economic outlook and how, they, how, how, how those trends are going. I'll give you an example today. Statistics is telling us that it's projecting that by 2050, we will be 5 million people. In, that's the projection. At 143 baht a day, it's projected that 2050 will be 5 million people. You have to start planning your country for 5 million people now. You don't wait until 2050. So out of these 5 million people, a citizens alliance government, obviously, will have an act in parliament called the, the Welfare of Future Generations Act to make it mandatory for any government project or initiative or policy to take into consideration the generation of the welfare of future generations. How? If we are building a road from Banjul to Sarakunda, we put into consideration that in 50 years' time, the number of cars we'll be using this road will not be 2,000 but 5,000, so build it to accommodate for 5,000. If we are building schools and planning our curriculum, we'll put into consideration that, look, this particular course might not be relevant in 2050. But in 2050, these are the kind of jobs, artificial intelligence and drones will be relevant. Therefore, start putting that into the curriculum now. So these kids, before they finish school, they will be relevant, the education will be relevant. This is how we are thinking. But if you think that, look, today what we need is carpenters, just make carpenters. You don't think that tomorrow we will need plumbers, you don't train plumbers. When we come to tomorrow, carpenters are irrelevant, you don't have any plumbers. This is the thinking. You think your plan can work? Why not? Oh. Why just explain to you why can't it work yeah but then um and i think did you test the plan elsewhere before you feel that you know it can it's working and it will you know working. why europe is developed today you see whatever we say we base it on empirical evidence we looked with before i entered politics even before when i was at university i was in sweden and i saw how the swedes and the swiss and the germans around their countries i did my research on how did they succeed that is what they did they have they they plan ahead they can see that in 2050, these are the kind of jobs that will be available. I'll tell you that even the, the Europeans, when they are building their net road networks, their infrastructure networks, they saw years back that there will be a time when we'll need internet networks. They left room to develop that. Europe, that's how Europe developed, and America. Not, it's not magic. That's how, so it's not about test. It's tested. It's sad and tested in our countries. Then they look ahead. They look at demographic trends. So in 2050, Five million people. Do we have enough roads for five million people? Today there's traffic congestion everywhere. Would the electricity be enough? If we have, if we got, if the, if our electricity needs 150 megahertz today, how much will we need in 2050? The failure of Nawek is not Boros' problem. His only fault is he didn't find a solution to the problem. But in 20, in 1990, the leaders could have sat and said in 2020, we'll have two million people. Therefore, electricity consumption will increase. Because then, in 2020, it will be an era of technology. There will be, in one household, on average, five mobile phones, microwaves, electric ions, flat screen TVs. So the production of electricity doesn't match the demand. That is the problem. Education as well. In 1990, they could have thought that, look, in 2020, we will be 2.3 million people. 60% will be young people. What do young people need? Vocational training institutes. Start building those now so that these kids now will be everywhere. But there is, there is none. No jobs. In Europe, you know what they do? They'll calculate that in 2080, for example, 60% of our population will be old people, the senior generation. What do they need? Healthcare. You start putting plans to build hospitals and their healthcare so that you don't wait until they get old and they have no healthcare. That is, lost. That is planning. You do planning ahead. Today we have a problem in this country, there is no planning. 60% of our population are living in urban Gambia. And urban Gambia was not meant to house 50%, 60% of the population. You know what are the effects of that? Mm -hmm. The demand for housing has increased. That is why the price now has increased. If you are paying 2,500 for Roman Palo, five, 10 years ago, now it's 6,000.
and even ask you to pay six months deposit. Because of the pricing has gone up, there is profit in housing in this country today. There is everybody investing in building, 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 without plan. That is why when it rains, they are flooding everywhere. It's not like the rains have increased, no. It's the way we are building, without proper planning. That is why if it rains, just a few milliliters, the whole country comes to a standstill. Because there is no planning. This is the, this is our vision, this is how we want to govern. So but you talk about planning and then many people will connect the lack of planning to our, to the fault of our academic ed education system. Um, like the methodologies that have been used in our schools, the curriculum itself, they say it's not actually fit, you know, to provide labor demand for the Gambia. Um, specifically, if CA government com comes into office, let's say 2021, Specifically, what do you plan for education? Two things. Reform investment. We have to reform the education sector. It is not fit for purpose. An education sector that cannot solve your complex problems, today's problems, is not fit for purpose. Scrap it. If it cannot create you the society you want, scrap it. Tell me one thing that our education sector is solving for us today in this country, all our problems. It's not solving our energy crisis. We don't have Scientists in our university inventing great ideas to solve our energy crisis, coming, even coming up with policies. No, it's not so. Even the potholes we are having, we have a school of engineering. We cannot, they cannot even sort of, uh, maintain our potholes, our roads. We still rely on Indians and Chinese to come and build us our infrastructural, infrastructural problems. Corruption is our major problem. Is our education sector helping us solve the issue of corruption? Well, no, because the curriculum doesn't teach our kids about ethics and morality and about professionalism in the public service. There's no course on that. Education sector, the curriculum is a cobweb. It's a colonial cobweb. Our education sector was established to serve the colonial project. The colonial project had an agenda. Every country, when you have an agenda, you tell your education se sector to support that agenda. The colonial education was to support the colonial agenda. Just like the colonial planning mm -hmm. because the colonial economic planning was extractive not developmental if you look at the way they build the railways and the roads it was to extract commodities and people from the hinterland to the to europe that is why most of these ports are in the capital cities mombasa lagos banjul dakar accra just to take it out they never built any infrastructure to connect african cities that is why today very little inter-african trade or even inter-african connection so when a government comes and you are serious, you look at the education sector and you reform it. You look at the trends as they are going today. You look at trends as they will emerge in 15, 20, 25 years' time. You look at your country's problems and you tell your education sector to solve those problems. Today our problems are potholes everywhere, bad roads. How do we invest into our school of technology, school of engineering, to produce those young Gambians who are going to solve our, those problems? So two things, you have to invest as well. Education is not cheap. Today, if you don't invest in your kids' education, you'll die in poverty, and the cycle of poverty will continue. You'll die in poverty, they'll die in poverty, their kids will. It's, it takes only one generation in a family to understand it and invest too much in their kids' education to break that cycle of poverty. The same thing with the nation. We have to invest. If you want the best brains to come to UTG, pay money. Build world-class labs facilities. Build world-class libraries. Bring in world-class brains and they engage in world-class cutting-edge research and innovation. You think this UTG, you bring in these master's degree holders from other places, Nigeria, Ghana, here, come and teach every just... We just consume knowledge. We are not producing knowledge in this country. All right. It's just knowledge consumption. Go and read Plato, go read Aristotle. Oh, those guys have done their time. Yes, it's good to know history, it's good to know philosophy, but we have problems now to solve practical knowledge actually of course. We need to. how do we solve those problems yeah. your party came and then it was greeted the establishment of your party was greeted by COVID 19. you could not do much um because of the pandemic all over you know if it exposes anything as far as gambia is concerned it's our health health sector and then you are aspiring to be president what is your plan what are your plans for you know standardizing gambia's health system well, healthcare is important. Um, a nation must be healthy. What we've seen is that it is the underinvestment in the healthcare sector. You have to invest in the healthcare sector. And two things are primary. 
for any government to focus on the healthcare sector, the software and the hardware. If you don't have those to write, it's like a computer. If the software is not working, the computer will not work. If there's no hardware, the software is redundant. What is the software? The human capacity. You have to train best nurses and doctors and give them incentives and motivate them to retain them, to serve with compassion. We also have to invest in the hardware, the equipment, healthcare equipment, first class blood bank facilities so we don't have to go around running for asking for blood because the woman needs it, she's dying at childbirth. Proper, proper equipment. These are the two things that make the health sector, but also thinking. How do you ensure that not only it is up to date and state of the art, but also affordable and and, 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 and how do you call it, and uh, people are accessible. Name me one major hospital in West Coast region. One major hospital in West Coast region, name me. West Coast region spans from Katong to Kalaji. Massive. The whole of Fony is part of West Coast region. The population is increasing on a daily basis. They have only one small health center in Brikama that they all go to. Name me one major hospital in West Coast region. You invest in primary health care. We will ensure that every area within a particular radius, depending on the population, we get access to a clinic, a healthcare facility as a first point of call. So you don't have to walk all the way from a particular village in Sarebojo to go to Farafenya to get access to healthcare. Why? You'll die on the way. Will you do that? Of course, yes. You need to, you see, there are two things you must provide for your population, even three. Three things. That is a must, it's a social contract. The population must not negotiate with any government on those issues. Access to healthcare, you must get it in your area. You don't have to walk kilometers to get access to healthcare. It's not supposed to happen in this country. Access to education, every area must have a good school. Why should Fajara kids go to Sebek and Marina because their parents can afford it? Or pipeline kids or kids from, and the kids from Sarebojo cannot access a private school. Are they all not Gambian kids? Why should my child go get access to good education and your child to poor education and we're all Gambians? My child's dream of becoming a pilot, he will fulfill it. Your child's dream of becoming a pilot, he will never fulfill it. Why? Because the state did not invest and ensure that every child has an opportunity of, an equal opportunity in life, a, a good start in life. That is the role of the state, to make sure that every citizen Starts good. How you fail it is your, it's up to you. It's up to hard work and talent and whatever. But everybody should be given an opportunity, an equal opportunity for a good start in life. So if the kids in Fajara, the kids in Pipeline, in Kirisirin, in Banjul, have access to good schools, the kids in Sarebojo, in Bantanto, in Boraba, must have access to the same kind of quality education. Because it's in Gambia. So that is, that is the healthcare sector, is to ensure that now you make sure you decentralize, you provide healthcare, primary healthcare for every part of the country. Okay. <clears throat> Gambians have heard that. So I will take you to the economy. You know, um, I think this is another you know, area that has been hardly hit by COVID-19. You know, tourism have been, you know, uh, accorded with nothing to prove. You know, taxes don't have, uh, those who should provide tax for the national economy, you know, their businesses could not proceed as expected. You know, um, this will need, you know, brains to come together to recover the economy. And then, you know, it needs good plan as well. What, in terms of plans, and then, you know, um, step, you know, to revive the Gambia's economy, let's say, for CA, if you take over office next year, what would you do? i tell you something, there are many different levels in which you can approach. You see, the economy is a structural thing. There is no one size fits all and there is no one solution to solving the economic problem. It's different levels, different times. You have a short term, the medium term and the long term policies that you have to implement. Some policies will take the long term to solve. Some will take the medium term, some will, you need the, long, the short term. There are very many different areas as well. Let's start with fighting corruption and ensuring that leakage is controlled in government. You know how much government, 
how much money the government is losing on a daily basis because of corruption, because of weak institutions, because of a lack of a political will to ensure that our money is controlled. It's in the billions of dollars. It's far much more than how much the government is getting in loans and grants. You have to also smart and not sacrifice long-term planning at the altar of political expediency. You see, government must be serious and there must be fiscal discipline in government. You cannot take and take huge loans, huge, huge loans, just to push, sponsor political projects and not social projects. If you look at the budget this year, they've taken loans in the billions in the so-called road construction schemes you don't for political purposes. Yes, we need roads. But if you look at the manner in which they are allocating these roads, mm -hmm. and the kind of, you, can't you don't take massive loans. You leave your whole entire two, three generations indebted just to build a few roads. Roads whereby even the contracts allocated are dodgy. They don't follow the right procurement processes. People are, corruption is everywhere. So fiscal discipline is key. Mm -hmm. So when you come to government, the first thing we'll do is come up with the policies to make so fiscal discipline, austerity. Government vehicles must be reduced. You cannot have government vehicles, every officer in government having a government vehicle. Government fuel, utilities, AC air conditioners are on, travel per dimes, workshops. If you look at the budget today, almost 90, 80 to 90 percent of government budget is spent, on, is spent on running a government and not on development. Most of development money is coming from outside. Whenever there is a development component in the budget, it is for political purposes, to build something and infrastructure for political purposes. That's how you see it. That's what's happening. Just look at the budget today. How much is allocated to agriculture to feed the nation? And how much is allocated to the office of the president to feed the president? You be the judge. How much is allocated to the office of the president? I leave it to you. You answer. It's much more than how much is allocated to agriculture. It means for, to feed the one man and his family, but it's much more than how much is allocated to agriculture as a sector. Does that make sense? To feed 2.4 million people or to put in place the processes, the money funding to feed 2.4 million people. But, the, but then the construction sites you also mentioned and those, the beneficiaries are also saying that that is welcome. No, we are not saying that should not be construction. Like I told you here, one of the things that we want to focus on as a government is to ensure, like I told you five things, our top priorities, education, health, but you are not, you are not satisfied Water. having some no, It's the manner in which they are doing the it. Manner. Okay. The people of Fony and You think it, you think it is politi politicized? It's politicized. I mean, listen, serious governments don't go and spend millions of dollars in, a, in the name of a so-called foundation, a laying of foundation stone, putting lives at risk during a pandemic. Serious governments build it first and the population use it. You have to prioritize. The roads that they are building are long overdue. They, these people deserve the roads. They are taxpayers. But there's a way you get the money to do it. Mm -hmm. And not at all cost. Now, if you build, if you have to make, a, you see, governments have to make choices. Right. It's either you build a road in that place or you build them a good school. Which one would you prefer? For example, I'm just giving an example. So you have to make choices and know your priorities. I know how to do it. Every corner of this country, from Kiang to Fonyi to Nyamina to Nyani, they all need, they all have, deserve good roads to, to Nyomi. Everybody, not even feeder roads, but even pe people's houses. We need good roads, infrastructure. We need clean water. We need good healthcare system. If you, if the people of Nyomi don't get access to good healthcare, you build them the roads. How will they use the roads if they are sick? Just look at Nyomi. There is no proper hospital in Nyomi. Is it you go to Farafenye or you come to Banjul? Now, Farafenye always refers you to Banjul. The tricky part is that whenever you are in an ambulance or in a car to come to Banjul, you arrive at Barra, the ferry is gone. There is no boat ambulance at Barra. How much does an o a boat ambulance cost? Just to station it at Barra. When you are sick, it just takes you straight away. You have to wait for the ferry. You die at Barra. How much does an old boat? And when I saw them politicking in Nyamina recently, Taking 10, 12, 13 brand new pickups. Each pickups cost thirty thousand dollars. You take those pickups to a village where they don't even have clean water. 
if you really care about those people, before buying those pickups, bring them water and electricity. How can you come to my village in my poverty with your brand new vehicle telling me to vote for you, you and your vehicle is much more expensive, it, it, can, it can get me water? You see, Gambians need to understand these things and stop allowing our leaders to take us for a ride. When did this NPP government come to government that now they are, they are showing us that they are richer than anybody else in this country? Brand new pickups, big events in the millions, paying politicians millions to come and join them. Where is the money coming from? The mansion they built in Mankamankunda, where did the money come from? Four years in power. You are questioning it? Of course, yes. Where did that money come from? The pickups they are parading around, the new pickups, where did it come from? Even Jame, for his first four years, he did not lavish such amount of money for political purposes. He did not. How do you describe? He was investing. How do you in describe? Schools. How do you describe Baro like um, in the space of four years? You know how he came and then how is he is now. How do you describe it? What description because you do you talk, want? You talked about you know lavishing. You talk about you know spending. Well, well money he's presiding over cars. the most corrupt government the government has ever seen in our history with very little regard to the plight of the population. With so much focus on his agenda to entrench himself, at any cost, even putting lives at risk, at any cost. And that is the unfortunate part, that moving away from Jame will come to have a president like that, who cares less about Gambians, who cares more about his political ambitions, and who just doesn't care about what's happening in this country. There's lawlessness in this country. Crime rate is increasing. There's traffic everywhere. Our kids are not going to school. The current system is crumbling. Our youths are without jobs and frustrated. They're living in droves to go to Europe and they're dying at sea. Who cares? Who cares? Doctor, you are expected to be confirmed following your nomination as the CA presidential candidate. But we understand that you hold the double citizenship. How do you go about this? Because Gambian law did say that you, you are not qualified to contest presidency with double, dual citizenship. Well, I was Gambian. I am Gambian. I will always be a Gambian. Therefore, if the law says that, I have to be a Gambian to run for office, to serve my people. The sacrifice I took in 2008 to leave everything I have in Europe and the jobs I was offered to come and teach at the university to prepare the young minds and equip them for the task ahead. The same sacrifice I will take to revoke my other citizenship to run for office. Which country? Sweden. And I've started that process. And very soon I'll get my certificate of revocation. And I'll not be a Swedish anymore. Okay. Yes. Gambia is, is worth for it. Listen, I was born here. I will die here. I'll be buried here. And if it means today, if there comes a message that they need to sacrifice blood for Gambia to move away from its predicament, I'll be the first to put up my hands and take my blood. When I started school in Sweden, one day I was sitting and thinking and reflecting, because I like reflecting about my situation. And I said to myself, if I become 80 years old and I reflect about my life and I revel in my successes, I thought, okay, I've got a few houses built, nice houses. I traveled all over the world. I lived nice. I dined in fine hotels, uh, had a beautiful kids and beautiful family. That is the dream of every person, that you live such a life. But that life is worthless and meaningless. If my education cannot really have a positive impact on my people, therefore my education just benefited me and my family. It did not benefit and change the lives of my people, then it's not a worthwhile life. And I took a pledge from that time that my every existence will be sacrificed for the Gambia. 
Even I'm ready. Even family. I sacrifice family for Gambia. I spend no time with my kids. I don't see them grow. I paid for myself my education. I paid from bachelor's to PhD. Nobody paid for me. No scholarship. Finishing PhD, I got offers to go and receive money. That is not my. That is not how I want to live my life. I want to live a fulfilling life. I want to be 80 years old and be reading the history books of the Gambia. How do you, what do you mean 80 years old? I'm just giving you an example. Okay. When I grow old. <laughs> All right. I might not grow, I might not live up to that time. May you live longer than that. <laughs> but just give you an example that when I grow old, you see, when, when you are old and you retire from public service or you retire from life, it's when you reflect more, you know that. Because you, you have so much time in your hands. It's when you start thinking about your life, the things you did. You start having more time to think. Right now, we don't have time to reflect. We are running up and down. My phone is ringing constantly. Your phone is you are busy. You don't have time to sit and reflect. When you are old and nobody cares about you anymore, people have, you, you become lonely. It's when you have time now to sit and reflect about your life. So when that happens and I start reflecting, I don't want to have any regrets. That my education did not really impact my country. That would be the biggest regret. And I wouldn't really forgive myself for that. For that not to happen, I want to sacrifice my everything, my life, to make sure that the people of this country live a dignified life, to make sure that every child born in this country is able to fulfill his or her dreams, that our kids are not going to the back way anymore to die on the high seas to get to Europe. Our women are not dying in child labor because there are no good hospitals, because there is no blood, or because of there are no good nurses or good equipment. That our farmers will be living in poverty for the rest of their lives. That a man or a woman who served this country as a teacher or as a police officer or as a nurse will retire after the age of 65 and be dying renting. After serving 40 years, dying in poverty. That our young boys and girls who are employed are not exploited. That everybody lives a good life, a dignified life. Having access to the most basics, clean water, that we take for granted in Europe and other places. Uninterrupted electricity, good education, good health care, access to the most basic infrastructure. That is the kind of Gambia I would I mean I want. And when I when I grow old and and I see that Gambia happening, I'll die in peace. But if I grow old and I see the same problems I had to go through, that my kids are still going through, I'll not die in peace. I will consider myself as a failure, and I consider my generation as a failure. And this is why you want to come and take the leadership of the country? There is no other reason. Absolutely no other reason. It's not for money, it's not for fame, because there is no money in the presidency. And these words, Gambians can take it to the bank? They can take it to the bank, they can put it under their pillows, they can even sleep and eat it. This is why we are into politics. And there will be no deviation from this agenda. I have a final question for you. And um, you look at the governance system, like uh, the presidential vows. You know, people, when they are in the opposition rank, they will make a lot of vows, promise, I'll do this. You know, in fact, the president that is serving the country presently did say that he is going to serve for only three years. That is his promise he made. But we've seen that, you know, he has taken another route opposite. Well, what can you ask for Gambian people that all this you have said here are going to be, you know, be, you know, put into practice by Dr. Ismail Sisi, you know, come 2021, the next president of the Gambia? Well, I think first we have to look at what we did so far. Every promise I've made to the Gambian people, I've fulfilled it. When I promise that if my education doesn't benefit my country, it is worthless, and that when I finish my education and come back to serve the Gambia, I did that. In fact, when I was coming, there was so much cynicism from my friends in Europe and family. Ah, it is me like JYK, and it is in Gambia. That was in 2008. Um, I endured. Because that was a promise I made. See, my legacy is more important to me than anything else. So you have to understand that it's difficult to convince Gambians because there's so much cynicism, especially in politics. Because why? Politicians have made so many promises and have failed the Gambian people. Therefore, if you come as a politician, you start talking, they always categorize you as that. But just give us the chance. 
and we will not fail. See, we are young. We have a long way to go in life. You have a long, you certainly have a long way in life. And then you are young. I'm thinking, you serve the country, let's say you will introduce 10 years maximum period. You, you, you have to leave presidency. What would be life for Dr. Sisi after that? I go back to academia. I go back to the classroom and teach. It's my passion, it's what I love. The quest to build the right minds to move this country will never end. We always need the manpower. You will not sit down? No, why should I? I'll go back. You'll be surprised that you'll see me teaching Introduction to Politics 101 again. I hope that time there'll be no break on my campus or by, on the, where there is no light. I hope that I will have a state-of-the-art university. But the issue is, like I said, we are into politics to change this country. We are into politics to ensure we build a country that is fit for purpose. To build a country for today and also for the future. To make sure even our animals will live in peace in this country. That is our dream. And that is what we have fulfillment from. Nothing else. Nothing else. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Yeah.